Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the gathering place right here in beautiful Simi Valley. I'm back from Traverse City, Michigan. Had some amazing meetings out there, some ma- amazing people, made some really good friends, um, which is always wonderful. It's always good to be back home. Now, we have um, a little bit of announcements. Now, it's a big announcement. We had scheduled Julie Green for next Saturday, the 4th, <clears throat> but the Lord has called her into prayer for a season of time, and you can, uh, you can read the, the caption from her website. So what we're going to do is we're going to reschedule. I don't know exactly when that's going to be yet, uh, but I talked to Natasha for quite a while today, and she's really feeling drawn of the Lord at this season of time. I mean, there's a lot going on in the world right now, a lot of things happening. We have multiple wars that are taking place, and we're in the middle of both of them. So there's things going on. There's a lot of distractions going on. You know, I was doing martial arts. One of the things I was really good at was you kick, you know, you kick low like you're going to somebody's leg, and they look down, and you pop them in the face. Um, as a matter of fact, if you, ever have, if you ever face anybody with a knife, number one, unless they're really good, know that they're probably not a good fighter. That's why they need the knife. Um, so you can have confidence. But then, you know, when they come up and they start doing whatever, just, you know, just spit right in toward their face. And when they go like that, their hand's going to go up and just come in and grab their hand. And, or, you know, you can grab their hand and kick them, whatever you want to do. I'm telling you, distraction works. And they've been distracting us for years and decades. Every time we go to find out the truth, they start up a couple more wars, say, it's your moral imperative that we're involved in the middle of this war. So <clears throat> I'm grateful that Julie is taking the time to seek the Lord. Uh, you know, a little disappointed that, uh, that she won't be here, but I, as I was talking to Tasha today, she said, you know, I believe, Bob, that when we do come, it's going to be greater, that it's, it's not just going to be us there ministering, but that's going to be a divine connection and that we'll be ministering together to the Lord. And so I really appreciated that and I believe that's exactly what's going to happen. And I was talking to Charlie Jordan because Charlie was going to fly in and, and play. He, he felt the same way. He goes, yeah, I feel, this is, uh, I feel that this is for another time. So um, well, why did we schedule this time? Well, that's because that's how we connected it. But I, I've learned prophets through the years that things change. You know, we, we worked with Kim Clement for years Except with Kim, they changed every 30 minutes. <laughs> that's, like, that's really a lot of truth. Oh, it's not quite that bad. But you know, every day, phone calls were coming into change. And so eventually, I just told Nora, I said, listen, wait till the last day, and then we'll make all the changes then. Because some things would change to one thing, then they would change back, then they would change there, and then we would change. So I said, wait till the last day, and then we'll just make all the changes at that point. And then, of course, the day, next day, which was the day of the meetings, they still could change, but at least you weren't changing all week long. But I, I, I love that Julie's going in and, and praying because God does nothing except he first reveals it to his servants, the prophets. And I believe that she'll hear the things that she's supposed to from God. Why can't God just, you know, speak, you know, just any, any old time? Well, sometimes there has to be a readiness of the vessel to hear you know, there's to be a readiness, or maybe God wants to speak on a higher level on your vessel. You have to get your vessel ready to hear what the Lord is saying. Anyways, you, you go here so you know that. All right. So let's, uh, let's get started tonight. And the title is Stepping into the Doorway of Wisdom, The Creative Spirit. Um, before we get into that, I want to share a couple scriptures, because I like to take the offering at the beginning. That way we don't have to mess around with it later. Let's do that. Okay. So I want to read from, from Isaiah 48, verse 17. And, and I think everybody here knows this, that seeking finances is not really very smart. Seeking the Lord is smart. But seeking the spirit of wisdom said, if you seek wisdom, it's better than seeking silver. It's better than seeking, I mean, genuinely seeking wisdom. Better than silver, better than gold, better than rubies. Now, almost nobody in the church realm believes that, or we would have been seeking wisdom for many years 
and not silver, gold, and rubies. If you are needs-minded, there's a good chance that you never connected with wisdom. Well, what should I do? Start connecting with her right now. I'll connect with her so I get a lot of money. No, if you do that, she knows the difference. She's one of the seven spirits of God. She's not stupid. She's smart. And she'll know that you don't really care to connect with her because if you connect with finances without wisdom, it becomes destructive because the love of money is the root of all evil. But here in Isaiah, in this particular prophecy, it says, Thus saith the Lord, Thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord which teaches thee to profit which leads thee by the way that thou shouldest go. So God does want to teach you to profit. I believe one of those avenues is the spirit of wisdom. He wants to teach you to profit so that prosperity doesn't destroy you. Because prosperity, you know, most very rich families, not all of them, a lot of them are just destroyed. It just tears them up. The NIT or NET says... This is what the Lord your protector says, the Holy One of Israel. I'm the Lord your God who teaches you how to succeed. So God is teaching you. If we listen while we pray, God is going to teach us what to do to succeed. What if somebody's 120? Should, should they just say, I'm done? No, listen. Until the day you leave this earth, every promise belongs to you. Now remember, a lot of the great people in the Bible didn't do anything till they were 80. <laughs> why, why is that? Because all the junk. You know, of course, Abraham, he was, uh, he was 99. But a lot of times we have a lot of junk. Now, Abraham, why did he have to wait till 99? Because he figured he would do it on his own. He'd help God out a little bit. Sarah pushing him. He had Ishmael. 13 years later, the, the number 13 is an amazing number. It means that God's going to do it despite you. That's why I was born on the 13th. That's like God's, that's my everyday message. I'm doing this despite you. <clears throat> but 13 years later, Ishmael was 13 years old when God came back and spoke to Abraham. I don't know if he wanted to wait till he was 100 or you know, 99 years old for him to do it, but he was. So sometimes you're in your own way. It took Moses 40 years to get out of his own way. He was 40 years old. He knew he was a deliverer. 40 years later, he didn't think he was anything. How do you know? Because you hear him talking to God. <clears throat> I'm, I'm praying that my messages get out and, and reach a lot of older people. A lot of older people think, well, I'm just, you know, I'm going to go golf a little bit and I ride the golf, you know, court. No. Those, those are the prime years in the kingdom of God. And once you hit 80, you hit your prime. <laughs> I'm not 80 for a while. Well, you can still seek the Lord. Now, God can use you no matter what age. You could look at David for that. But I'm saying that it doesn't matter what age you are, these promises belong to you. I don't know why I had to say that tonight, but I'm saying that by the Spirit. That the Spirit is just talking to people and saying, throw that whole age thing out. I mean, literally throw it out. It's not your age, it's your walk with God. Which, by the way, aged people are, are going to be unaging. More and more, they're going to be unaging. Oh, I, I know that here, Bob, but I, I just don't think it's going to happen. I'm telling you, it's happening. It's already happening. Actually, I had a fun, kinda, fun little story of something that had a real supernatural thing happen to me in Michigan. Um, I'll tell you in a minute. It was, it was amazing. It was like after I had a dream about something, then something happened, and I'm like, oh, that was interesting. I didn't even know what was happening. What is it, Bob? I'll tell you in a minute. Proverbs 13, 22. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, the wealth of sinners laid up for the just. Well, why are you reading that out of, after Isaiah 48? Because Isaiah 48 says God teaches you. And then what do you do? You leave the inheritance to the next generation. That means you teach the next generation. Now, we allowed the next generation, the church world from the, really the 1960s, but from the 1970s, we said, we're being raptured, we're leaving. Uh, so we gave no future, no hope to the next generation, and we allowed the school systems, 
which the devil had been slowly weaseling his way into to train up our children how to be ungodly. Just the fact that they teach evolution, which is mathematically impossible. Any mathematician knows that. But they teach it because it's a belief. It's called the theory of evolution. It's not, a, it, it, it's not, a, it's not science-based. It's theorized by Darwin, who was holding Bible studies at his house at the end of his life, said people took theories that I had and they turned them into doctrines and beliefs. No, they were, they were demonic doctrines and beliefs. He said they were unformed ideas that people took. They, they couldn't be formed. Where's the missing link? Well, one day, one day we'll find it. No, nah, it's not, not to be found. It's just not, not anywhere. Well, such and such, Anthropithecus man or whatever they call it, he was, oh, oh, oh he was actually a monkey. Well, this man uh, over here, he, oh, oh, he was actually an old man that was hunched over. Well, Lucy, she was, oh, she came, from the, she came from the tooth of a pig. Their whole theories are bad. And then when they told us, when I was in school, dinosaurs died out over millions and millions of years, except they kept finding all this proof that they died instantly. That was the flood. So they had to revise their theory. A meteor hit the earth and everything died instantly. How did life, how did life form? Well, <clears throat> amino acids uh, came together and formed proteins. Well, who was stirring them? It's the aliens! Well, I'm telling you, that's why the whole alien thing became big. Because I have to push that garbage now. Because... It doesn't add up. It can't happen. From the, the chimpanzee, the closest genetic thing to a human being cannot mathematically happen. It could never, ever evolve into a human being, ever. It's not mathematically possible. But that's what they taught our children. Then our children just sit there and go, okay, teacher said so. Unless they go and research it. So we gave generations over. So you know what? We are the guilty party, uh, those of us that are a little bit older. So now we are praying for the transformation of those generations to the kingdom of God. That was a pretty bad amen. I got like a half an amen there. I better move on. All right. The blessing of the Lord, it makes you poor and gives the next generation to the devil. No, the blessing of the Lord makes rich. He has no sorrow with it. When you look at this one here, inheritance to our children's children, the Lord teaches us the prophet. He teaches us the kingdom so we can pass it on to the next generation so they become greater than we are. What are we passing on to the next generation? We're supposed to pass on healing and restoration so that they can overcome death. According to Bob Jones' prophecy, 2030. The blessing of the Lord makes rich. He doesn't make poor. Well, Bob, the economy seems to be going downhill. You know, when they're actually doing the, the prices and measuring the prices, it's not 7%, it's like 75%. Some things over the last year, over 100% difference. Why? Because you have to be a Noodle Meyer Straussberg to mess up an economy that bad. You, you can't, it's not accidental. Listen. Just because that guy's standing up there mumbling and can't say his own name and, and doesn't know where he is, he's not the one doing anything. The people doing it, they know on purpose exactly what they are doing. You have to understand that, and we have to pray against that demonic thing. We cannot agree with what they're doing to our economy because it's demonic. Now, listen, it doesn't just hurt Americans. It hurts everyone. And then when you have, you know, when you have the energy prices so high... Then we're in, involved in a couple of wars, so all of our money is going to go there. That is the plot of the enemy, to destroy the prosperity of the greatest nation on the world. But it's going to be the believers that transform it. 
When they wanted to mess around with our water, what did God do in a little church in Simi Valley? He prophesied that the rain was coming and how it was coming. And we've never had that steady, consistent rain ever that long in California. But we had it because there was somebody praying. Somebody was praying and God put a prophetic voice in a place where we believed in the future. And we began to prophesy that night and it happened exactly like we prophesied. So we're prophesying a transformation to the economy of the United States of America and of the state of California. We're prophesying the gas prices. Whenever I see them go up, I'll start prophesying during the offering that they're coming down. They're coming all the way down. It's thought of a funny name my mom used to call people. I was thinking of, you know, the guy that mumbles. Anyways, um, we don't need to read this one. So let's do this. Let's go ahead and receive the offering tonight for the gathering place. And if you're giving by check, you can make it out to the gathering place or to Soren Ministries. And if you're, same thing when you're giving by text, which is right up there on the board, you can scroll down to either one of those and give to those. All right, are we ready? Well, Mark's ready, nobody else. Well, Randy's kind of ready. He was a little bit late. Are we ready? Yeah. All right, let's pray. I love you, Father. And I thank you that you love America. I thank you that you love our state, the state of California. And I prophesy the blessing of the Lord is making California rich. And you're raising up prayer warriors all across our state. And the movement of the Holy Ghost is going to be born here and flow to all the states and to other countries. China, Japan, Australia, even the United Kingdom. Your Holy Ghost power and the outpouring of the Holy Ghost is going to flow from the state of California. We thank you for that, Father. And Lord Jesus, we bring our tithes and offerings to you. You are our high priest. After the order of Melchizedek, we ask you to bring our tithes and offerings. Present them unto the Father as an offering in righteousness, as a sweet savor. And we humble ourselves tonight, Father, by proving you in this way. And we receive into our hearts and lives, into our state and nation, your blessings, the opening of the windows of heaven, to pour out a blessing. There's not room enough to receive. And we thank you, Father, that you're rebuking the devourer for our sake. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, ushers, go ahead and receive the offering. So tonight we are in the third part of Proverbs chapter 8. We did, uh, we did parts 1 and 2 the last couple weeks. We're in part 3 and this part is how to walk into the doorway. So let's just reiterate a couple things very quickly. Let's go over a little bit here. In Isaiah 11 verse 2 it says, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. These are the seven spirits of God. We know from Revelation, and this, this here, you know, I had not only read this so many times, I had memorized this many years ago, and I never caught this. But John, he's speaking to the seven churches, and he, he has a standard greeting, grace be unto you, and peace. 
which is in most of the epistles. From him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Now that greeting is not anywhere else, but it's here in Revelation where more is said about the seven spirits of God than anywhere else in the Bible. So John must have, must have had more revelation concerning the seven spirits of God than anybody else. Even more than Isaiah. And from Jesus Christ. So who's he talking about up top? The Father. From the Father. From the seven spirits and from Jesus Christ. The seven spirits are put there in the middle of the greeting between the Father and between Jesus Christ. Now there's some people that like to say, well, it's the sevenfold spirit of God. But it doesn't say that. Uh, you can look at it through all the different translations. There's one of the cheesy translations that talks about the sevenfold spirit. But it doesn't say that. The literal translations, the seven spirits of God. And I submit to you that the Spirit of the Lord is not the Holy Spirit, but is the Spirit of Jesus. I submit that from what we're going to read in a minute, but also from 2 Corinthians 3, when it says that we are transformed into the same image, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. All the translators agree there that's not saying the Holy Spirit, but that's the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, because we become transformed to His image. You don't become transformed to the image of the Holy Spirit. You become transformed to the image of Jesus, the Word of God. So we're changed into His image, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So here in Revelation 3, Unto the angel of the church in Sardis write these things, saith he that hath the seven spirits of God. So Jesus has the seven spirits because He's the one in the middle. He's the one directing them. The seven stars. Revelations 4, 5. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. They're before the throne. Why? They're part of the Godhead. Spirit of wisdom is with God when he created everything. Last one. I know you guys know this really well, but you're going to know it even better. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain. We know that's Jesus. Having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. He has them. Sent forth into all the earth. It's a sevenfold spirit of God, Bob. No, it's that he has them. He's at the right hand of the Father. He sent them into the earth. Why are they in the earth? To mentor you. To teach you how to become just exactly like him. Except with your own unique personality. Bob, I'll, I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll just want to be like Jesus. All right? We've got to figure out the walking on the water thing if you want to be like Jesus. Got to figure out the casting out devil thing. The raising the dead thing, got to figure all that out. That's, that's, that's what Jesus is like. Now, all of you don't have to do all of that, but together we all have to do that. You know, we got to figure out how to take the boat in the middle of the sea and transfer it to the other side. I'll just, well, no, I don't want to be like Jesus. Well, he did, that's, that's what Jesus is like. Jesus walked in the dominion that God gave Adam. Let me just tell you this. And this came up in a conversation I was having with somebody. Demons have zero dominion on the earth. They never had dominion on the earth. What they had was they had man. Actually, Yolanda and I were talking about it. They had man because man had dominion. Then demons use men to exercise their dominion on the earth. And the men think the demons are giving them power. That was our conversation. So. so demons give people, they say, do this, do all these strange ceremonies, and you'll have power, and you will have power. But the thing is, the people already had the power. The demons never had the power, but they made the people think they got the power from them. But they don't have the power. 
Demons are even called the prince and the power of the air. He has no power on earth. But Jesus, having a physical body, having a human body, he could exercise all the power that Adam was given in Genesis 1.26 and in Psalm 8. Psalm 8 shows we never lost it, that man never lost the power, never lost the dominion. Well, Bob, I'm struggling with. Yes, you are. Why? Because you, don't know, you have no idea who you are. I'm in a, a situation. That's because you have no idea who you are. Now, everybody has circumstances. Don't get me wrong. But almost everybody doesn't know who they are. By 2060, according to Bob Jones, the whole church will know who they are and have dominion over death, the weather, not only pe raising people from the dead, but people not dying, but reversing in age, and even our clothes and stuff not wearing out. But I want new ones. Yeah, I know. But our stuff won't wear out. Imagine, imagine having a car for 30 years. Just keep going and say, put the new technology in there, you know. Well, maybe you should buy a new car. No, this one works fine. When was the last time you changed your tire? 30 years ago. That's what he's talking about. That's having dominion. We have the dominion. But because we don't know who we are, well, we kind of know. We know who we're supposed to be, but we really don't know who we are. Any believer who knows who he is could never, ever get sick again. No sickness could ever come on your body. No death could ever come on your body. Now, there's no condemnation to anybody here or anybody listening. I'm trying to inspire you to understand this is, this is what the seven spirits of God, they're sent to teach us how to become sons, how to walk as sons. It's their job. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit can't do all the work. Matter of fact, in the creation of man, or I should say, the creation of the earth, the Holy Spirit was brooding upon the earth. He was brooding over the earth, and God's saying, but next to God is wisdom. We're going to read that in a minute. Next to God is wisdom. Giving him the calculations and how everything works. He worked with wisdom. I'm just running these so you can see the seven spirits. This is the Passion Translation version. You could see slightly different, but it's the same. I'll just separate them to categories so you can look at them. Say, oh, those are the seven spirits. And then anybody wants to take a picture or whatever, we can do that as well. Wisdom is the creative spirit. Solomon was doing stuff and stuff was operating in his kingdom like no other kingdom. So all the kingdoms of the world were coming to him. In Proverbs 8.12, it said, I wisdom dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. It's interesting that um, one of the things we did was we did an engagement with wisdom after we went through Proverbs 8. I was amazed. Now, we went through it quite a few hours, but I was amazed at the engagement that everybody there had with the spirit of wisdom. And when they started sharing their experiences, you could see the, I, I could tell them the kind of engagements they were having. You could see they were having major engagements. And one of them said, well, I saw this person look like this. I go, that's prudence. That's not the spirit of wisdom, but that's prudence. Prudence dwells with wisdom. Now, I, I said I would tell you a story, and I almost forgot. But I had a dream. Uh, remember the dream that I had about Genesis 17, the seed? And, and also Galatians 3? But in that dream, there were two times in the dream I was trans-relocated. I was taken somewhere else. And... Um, I think, it was a, I think it was the first day, I want to say it was the first day of the meetings in Traverse City. From the place I was staying to where we were doing the meetings, it was like 22-minute drive. Also, Tina's son, Christian, picked me up, and we get in the car, and we're just talking, 
Then we get there, and Christian noticed because he looked at his he looked at his watch. But then the guy who walked him out when he left was like, "How did you get back here so fast?" It took us, and he wasn't speeding. It took us eight minutes to drive 22 minutes to get to get. It took what would take 22 minutes took us eight minutes. We gained 14 minutes somehow. Are you sure, Vav? Well, if, if it was just one person, maybe not, but there was two people. The one guy, he goes like, how did you get back? Like, what did you do? You can't even drive that fast and make it, make it there and back like that. And it wasn't, it wasn't the first part when he came, because that was the normal time. But when he looked at his watch, and then the guy saying, how did you get back so quick? It was when I got in the car. Why is that? Because the spirit of trans relocation is on me. And I'm just... I was just telling the Lord, I'm like, <laughs> I was driving down here today. I'm like, let's, let's, let's move up the timetable on this. And he said, well, it's up to you, buddy. So we're moving up the timetable because I'm going to do it by faith to where I can just step in here. What? Well, you can't, you can't do that. I think Jesus could do that kind of stuff. Now, listen, he didn't always do that. Well, you know. Sometimes he traveled by boat. But when the boat wasn't there, he walked on the water. Now, he could have just trans-relocated there, but what would happen to those guys on the water if he did that? He could have just went to the other side because we, we know he did it. Why didn't he do it? Because if he didn't walk on the water, those guys would have drowned. Now, I know we discussed this before. Jesus probably had a pretty good idea the storm was coming. I'm not saying he absolutely knew it. But he's trying to teach them something. He's trying to teach them to have dominion. But instead, they're crying out, ah, ah. <laughs> But thank God Jesus isn't as sweet as we are, because if he was, he would have just said, It's okay, guys. You know, it's a lot of pets. It's all right. It's okay, you're dying of cancer. No, that's not all right. That's not okay. Jesus was a little bit, he was slightly merciless. He told them they had little faith. As a matter of fact, after the resurrection, he told them they had little faith. And you know what else he told them? He told them their hearts were hard. So you got to work on your hearts. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I, I am signing up for the next year's course in your school. No, American Christians, they're not signed up for anything. This guy's always chewing me out. He wasn't chewing them out. He was trying to teach them. So he's letting them go on the water to the other side. And he still the storm once. And that, you know, he stilled the storm before. Figured they maybe should know by now. But they didn't figure it out. So what's he doing? He's walking right past them. And he would have walked past them, except... Peter cried out to him. Lord, if it's you, bid me come. Come on. They thought he was a spirit at first because, you know, who walks on water? Come on. You know, what, you know what was wrong with Peter? One of his biggest issues? He was a fisherman walking on the water. Now the bookworms, you know, like Matthew the tax collector and Luke the doctor, they might have done better. But because he's a fisherman, and he knows that realm. That's like a doctor getting healed. Sometimes the doctors, they, they say doctors are the worst patients. Because they know too much, and their brain gets in the way of getting healed. But there's Peter. He, you know, he actually walks on the water. It's pretty good. But everything he sees, the waves, he sees everything going on around him. And his circumstances sunk him. Well, it wasn't really his circumstances that sunk him. It was... Peter's focus on his circumstances that sunk him. If you focus on circumstances that are destructive, they will sink you. But if you focus on the word of the Lord and what God is saying and what the Spirit is saying, you will not sink. But Bob, I'm going through a hard time. I know. But the key is you're going through it. You will get out on the other side. So Jesus, 
Peter starts sinking because he was too focused on his circumstances. He was a fisherman, and he got focused on everything that was going on around him because he was familiar with it. And he cried out to Jesus, and Jesus, he lifts him up. It's been pretty strong. You know, Peter, I, I'm guessing Peter was the stoutest of the guys, except for Jesus. He was stouter. He was probably a little bit bigger than all of them. He was a carpenter. I'm going to say he was the strongest one. And he just picked him up. Come on, buddy. They get back in the boat. He said, oh, you have little faith. I don't think that's fair. Do you? He should have been like an American Jesus. It's all right. Everybody sinks sometimes. That's an American Jesus. It's okay if all your circumstances look really bad. The problem with that is you never do anything. I don't know if any other churches in California prophesied to the rain exactly the way it would happen, but I know one where they did. Where's that? Where the leader is a merciless prayer warrior. What do you mean merciless? Like, don't give me excuses why you're not praying. Keep them for the devil. You know our church, you know our church in Northridge was so successful because so we, we, pray, we, we prayed a lot at that church. <clears throat> but I was more merciless when I was younger. Like if people started falling asleep while we were praying, instead of being grateful they were there, I'd yell at them. When are you sleeping? You know, I would kick them or something. Say, hey, wake up. If people chatted too much, you know, I, I kind of let that stuff go a little bit now, but they chatted too much, say, hey, take it outside. We're here to pray. I'm not saying that I was necessarily right about everything, but I was the leader. But you know what? I had a lot of results, a lot of great healings in that place. Jesus had high expectations for his men. And I have high expectations for you. I expect for you to walk on the water. I expect for you to trans-relocate. I expect for you to heal cancer. I expect for you to drive out demons. I expect all of that. And I expect you to reverse the death in your bodies. And if you have bad knees and bad legs and bad whatever, I have expectation those things are going to turn around. Yeah. Who's going to teach the next generation? If we don't do it, Bob, no, I don't know if that can... No. Listen, the angel of the Lord came to me. I told you, it's been about three months now. The angel of restoration came to me. I started telling me what to start to believing for. And then told me that I'm not ready for the next level of visitation. <laughs> I need to pray more. All right, I said I get on it. <clears throat> well, that took a long time to not even read one verse. <laughs> That's just some stuff in my heart about restoration. I guess, I guess having that, that eight-minute trip, 22 minutes in eight minutes, was kind of fun. You know, and Tina, she had a thing. She had a bunch of diamonds manifest. And then somebody called her and said, Tina, diamonds are manifesting, the prophet. 18 diamonds. And the Lord spoke to her husband and said, there's 18 diamonds in here. And they started looking around. They found 18 diamonds. I mean, they're little ones, but they're, they're diamonds. What are you saying, Bob? I'm saying, listen, you're supernatural beings. Get ready for it. Try to turn the news off a little bit more because they're not telling you anything you don't know, and they're telling you everything you don't need to know. You really don't need to know some of this stuff. All right. Other than... I, no, I better not say that. All right, I wisdom dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. One says ingenious inventions. I believe that the spirit of wisdom has been trying to give creative inventions to the children of God, but we have been closed off thinking we're not good enough or we're not smart enough or that we should be broke or we shouldn't have it. But I believe that if you say, God, I'm open up to what you want to show me, he's going to show you witty inventions, more 
Witty ways to do things. It could be things on the, online. It could be an app. It could be something simple. And you could make millions. Kat Kerr already knows a bunch of women that are connected to her that became millionaires. And they're, they're not, none of them are engineers. They're housewives. They're not, even, they're not professional women. They're housewives. God showed them inventions and they became millionaires. All right. Nobody likes that. We'll move on. So Proverbs 8.22, this is wisdom speaking, and she says, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from everlasting, from the beginning or ever the earth was, before any of this stuff was here. Let's look at it, the Passion Translation. In the beginning I was there, for God possessed me even before he created the universe. From eternity past. In other words, she's been with him forever. There are some spirits that have been with God from the beginning. And these seven spirits of God. You see, what's God's beginning? We don't know. But when Moses... Come here, Michael, stand right here. And it's just, just face, the, face the camera there. So we'll call Michael, we're going to call Michael God, puff him up a little bit. So Moses, he said to Moses, he says, Moses, you can look at my glory. He goes, he goes, you can't see my glory. You can't see my face, but you can look at my backside. So if I'm Moses and Michael's God, and I'm looking at the back of Michael, what do I see? I see everything that's in front of him. Thank you, Michael. You there. If I was to turn around and look at his face, I would see everything that came before but Moses couldn't see everything that came before. What did he see? He saw into the future. He saw God's future. And when he saw that, what did he see? He saw a guy standing on a mountain, being transfigured. And he saw Elijah. What do you mean? When Moses looked at the rock, when Moses was put in the cleft of the rock, that's where he saw Jesus. When Elijah was being lifted up, that's where he saw Jesus. And Moses represented the law, and Elijah represented the prophets, and they witnessed Jesus. They witnessed, Moses witnessed the God that he could see. He couldn't see God sitting on the throne, but you know the God he could look at? Your Savior and my Savior. He could look at the Savior, and that's what he saw. From eternity past. So, wisdom has been with God forever. And, and, you know, the first part, she's speaking a lot about what she's saying to us and, and what she'll do with us. I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Riches and honor are with me. Listen, let's be honest. Most Christians have not sought wisdom or we'd have riches and honor. Yea, durable riches and righteousness means no matter what time it is. What does that mean? That means that we have to seek wisdom. But I'm, I'm, seeking, I'm seeking the Holy Spirit. Me too. You're seeking the Holy Spirit more than we... Yep. But I'll tell you a story, and I know I've told it before, but it makes my point. Because what did he say? What did he say in Acts chapter 6 when they said, they said, you know, the people were going, hey, you know, they're not administering the food right to everybody. That's why socialism never works well. Even in the New Testament church, it didn't work that good. And it's not working for America. Well, you can't go broke, though. It's pretty good about that. So, the disciples and the apostles now, and they said, find us seven men full of the Holy Ghost and of wisdom. What? I mean, why did the angel come and appear to Paul? He had the Holy Ghost, right? And Paul had the Holy Ghost when he's on the ship. Why did the angel come and appear to him? <laughs> There's the Holy Ghost. Let the Holy Ghost speak to him. No, he needed, an, he needed an angel. Why did Peter have to have a vision? He had the Holy Ghost 10 years, and he couldn't hear that they're supposed to preach the gospel to every creature. They, could, they were only preaching to the Jews. What happened? Well, there was something within them that wouldn't allow them to hear the Holy Ghost about that subject 
So God had to send some help. That's just, I'm just making way too much sense tonight. So this happened back when we were in the temple, and we were, we were praying. It was in the early part of the meeting, and we were just praying in the Holy Spirit. And it was, just, it was hard to pray. There was just something there. Something wasn't right in the meeting. We were, so we were struggling to pray. I could feel the struggle. It was hard to pray in tongues. And um, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, engage the spirit of wisdom. The Holy Spirit told me to do that. The Holy Spirit didn't say engage the Holy Spirit. We're already engaging the Holy Spirit, praying in the Holy Spirit. So we stopped and we engaged wisdom. And when we did that, something broke. And all of a sudden, the prayer, everybody knows it. The prayer was so easy after that. And I remember talking to Ian about that. I said, I said, Ian, why was that? And he goes, because wisdom is one of the seven spirits of God. So the Holy Spirit, you're praying the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's there. But suddenly you bring in one of the seven spirits of God and it changed the atmosphere. Now she's talking about her relationship with the Father. In the first part, she's talking about her relationship with us. And at the end, she's talking about her relationship with us. But in this middle part here, the part we're touching tonight, She's talking about her relationship with the Father and how they created the earth together. Something different. Verse 24. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills, was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. That's everything above, not the third heaven where God dwells. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth. When he established the clouds above. When he strengthened the fountains of the deep. When he gave to the sea his decree, the water should not pass his commandment. Do you know that's why the water stop at a certain part, the shorelines? That, that's, that's your authority. This scripture right here, Proverbs 8, 29, that's your authority to stop water, if you live on the coast, from coming in and destroying your house. That's your authority right there. That's scripture. So the water should not pass his commandment. When he appointed the foundations of the earth. I mean, the earth's built on foundations. Bob, what do you think about the hollow earth theory? I think you, I think you watched Godzilla versus Kong. <laughs> yes, there is, there is a hollow earth and King Kong sitting on his throne down there with the other Kongs. And now you're Kong-fused. <laughs> Bob, is the earth flat? <laughs> there are foundations that God has built the earth on. Listen, I love all the flat earth stuff. It's so much fun to listen to, and it's, you know, it's like a really good science fiction. As a matter of fact, I think somebody should make a, a science fiction movie on the flat earth. I would go watch it probably a couple times. I would think it was fascinating. Would you believe it? No, but it still would be fun. It's kind of like all the rapture movies. You know, they're... They're, it's all make-believe. But all the Christians are going to watching these make-believe movies and going, oh, my God. You know, I saw some kind of commercials, Christian commercial. It's something about being left. You know, I know those movies are called like Left Behind and stuff, but it was something about where you know, people, you see everybody the vanishing. It's called the vanishing or something. And I'm like, hey, that's kind of neat. It's not, we're not going to see it in our lifetime, but it's kind of neat. I think we have to get some real truth from the scriptures. So this is wisdom saying, I helped God measure the earth, set it in order when he was weighing the fountains and where the foundations would be and how the clouds would be above and all these things. Wisdom said, I, I was there with him. I was, I was the one with him doing all this stuff. Now she doesn't say that the other 
spirit of understanding or knowledge, but they might have been, they might have been with him too. But in this eighth chapter of Proverbs, it's wisdom that's speaking, not something else. Everybody still with me? Okay. Wisdom, God set the vision. And wisdom helped to form the parameters of the vision that God had for the earth. Not just the earth, but for the universe. I think that wisdom might help you with the parameters of the vision that God has given you. That's just a thought. Verse 30, then... I was by him. Remember, after we just read, gave to the sea its decree, the water should not pass the commandment, when he pointed the foundations of the earth. Then I was by him as one brought up with him. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. In the Passion Translation, it reads like this. I was there close to the Creator's side, as his master artist, as his master artist. Daily he was filled with delight in me as I playfully rejoiced before him. I laughed and played so happy with what he had made while finding my delight in the children of men. You have to understand this. Sometimes your angels get annoyed with you because they're just sick of it. They're sick of the whining. (laughs) But wisdom rejoices with us. Wisdom has fun with us. She's, she knows how delighted God was in, in when he created us. She knows the depth of who we are to God, and she rejoices over that. She loves that. Now, let me go back here. Now, therefore, this is wisdom speaking again. Hearken or listen unto me, O ye children, for blessed are they that keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise and refuse it not. Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the post of my doors. That's, that's pretty, pretty explicit instruction. Like, you need to wait at my gate, you need to watch at my doors. I was never taught this. I, I was never taught this in Bible school. People just say, oh, read the Proverbs and you'll get, you know, get wise. You know, Jesus is the spirit of wisdom, but he's not because it's a female spirit. Now, you know, some people say, well, there's sevenfold spirit of God. It's just part of the spirit of God. No, it's not. She is an individual spirit. It's like people are like, they have this in their mind. There's the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Well, there's a couple of angels, you know, Gabriel, Michael, you know, you know, maybe your guardian angel, but you know, that's it. So you read about the stuff around the throne and the seraphims and all these other beings, and you're like, really, that's it? Like we have no contact with any of them? What was the being, what was the being that, that uh, actually stood in front of the woman in the garden? It was, it was a serpent, Bob. Because the seraph, seraph spirits look like serpents. What was it? So listen, my sons and daughters, Passion Translation, to everything I tell you, for nothing will bring you more joy than following my ways. Listen to my counsel, for my instruction will enlighten you. You'll be wise not to ignore it. If you wait at wisdom's doorway, longing to hear a word for every day, joy will break forth within you as you listen for what I'll say. So here's the question. If we're supposed to wait at the doorway of wisdom every day, that doesn't say to wait all day, but at least give some time every day to waiting at wisdom's doorway, 
Like, I don't say good morning to wisdom in the, you know, I don't say good morning, wisdom. I say good morning, Father. Good morning, Jesus. Good morning, Holy Spirit. I don't even say good morning to my angel. I just realized that. <laughs> Probably kind of annoying. Them. Like, I never say good morning to my angel, but I figure it's enough to say, you know, to God. I don't say good morning to wisdom, but you know what? I, one of the things I do in the morning is I go into Proverbs 8, different translations, and I just start going, to, you know, through it, but I've memorized it. What are you doing? I'm waiting at her gate. Proverbs 8, the, the Holy Spirit showed me this, that Proverbs 8 is the gateway to wisdom. Bob, I'm really, I'm really terrible at memorizing. That's even better. What do you mean? The slower you memorize it, the more you'll have it. It's not about memorizing. It's about going there every day and going over it. What I have to be careful of is that is getting in a hurry and not slowly going through it. Because it's easy. You know, you have it. You go, and you just go, you can go right through it. If I do that, I'll back up and I'll redo it again. Sometimes I, wake, sometimes I do wake up in the morning and I'll, I'll just be going, it'll just be going through me. I promise you God will bless you when you wait at the gate of wisdom and the doorway of wisdom. You know, if, if you're going to somebody's place, where do you go first? You go to the gate. Once you get past the gate, you go to the doorway. Wisdom has a house. We'll talk about that more maybe next week. Wisdom has a house, been in her house, says she's builded her house. She's hewn out her seven pillars. She has a house. She has a table that she sets, verse 3 of chapter 9. She has maidens, says she sends out her maidens. So she has beings that work with her. Now here's the thing. Wisdom is not omnipresent like God is. And even Jesus, you say, well, Jesus could be anywhere. Well, yeah, but he's at the right hand of the Father. Wisdom is at her house, and she's not saying, I'm coming to you. She's saying, it's saying that she's crying out to you from the city, from like she goes, she cries out for us. But it says when we're coming to her, we have to go to her gates, we have to go to her doors. Now, you can engage wisdom and you can see her right here, but that means you've just stepped into her realm, which is the spirit realm, which is God's realm. But you've stepped into her realm and you can see her. Well, what happens when I see her? I have impartations. She'll speak things to me. Like, I used to write everything down every time I had an engagement with her. And if some, I look back and I go, man, I'm not that smart. You have engagements with wisdom. But, but when you have engagements with wisdom, she leaves something with you. Now, when I'm in intercession, am I looking to wisdom to help? No, I'm not. You know, when I'm in intercession, I'm praying with the Holy Spirit. I'm interceding over things, maybe over our nation, maybe over you. Maybe God's bringing your face before me. There are different things we do as believers. But I think this should be part of your day. And I think it should be an early part of your day because I believe that wisdom helps to give us instruction that brings us through the day. The Holy Spirit knows what your day holds. He, he sees the future. And you may have a really troubled day ahead. But if you walk in wisdom, you're going to get by it. Now, Proverbs 15.1 says this. It says, a soft answer turns away wrath. Do you know that you can almost de-escalate every situation by following the wisdom of Proverbs 15.1? Somebody's mad or and you, and you speak softly. Do you know it will de-escalate almost every situation? Maybe not everyone. You might have to kick somebody once in a while. But, it, but, but for the most part, I'm sorry, officer, but you know... <laughs> he came at me. It was a mistake. But most of the time, you can de-escalate situations with a soft word. I've done it a thousand times. 
Well, that's wisdom. That's the spirit of wisdom showing you how to do things. A soft word can de-escalate. You know, people are angry, they're upset. Soft word can de-escalate most things. I've seen other people, I've watched other people use it. I watched that. I watched a guy who was, uh, was in, I was, uh, what do they call that? When you um, confront somebody over their drinking or something like that, intervention. And this guy was just, he, just, he was so angry at the intervention. And, and the guy who was doing the intervention just was so cool, so calm, no matter what he said. He just kept his calm. He de-escalated the whole thing. I just watched that go, wow, that guy's brilliant. That guy is brilliant. All he did was he just spoke softly and just kept de-escalating it. So everything you need is here. But for you daily, for you daily to have the wisdom you need to fulfill the things that you're called to, Proverbs 8 is your, it is the gateway and it is the doorway. Man, I didn't think it was going to take me this long to teach this tonight. Because really, I really want to touch on doorways because it's wisdom that talks about the doorway. Wisdom says, I have a doorway. We know that there are spiritual doorways. So let me read this to you out of John. Jesus answered and said unto them, Unto him, truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So when you're born again, a doorway opens. You see the kingdom. How many people see the kingdom? Almost none. They don't, they're not even taught that you can see the kingdom. But we can. Nobody taught us to, to look, to, to see angels. But Paul's praying, I pray the eyes of your heart be enlightened. Or the eyes of your imagination be open." But nobody tells us that. Oh, it's your imagination. Well, yeah, no, it is your imagination, but it's, it's connected to God. Nicodemus saith, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So here Jesus is telling us, you have two doorways. You have a doorway to see and a doorway to enter. But in Proverbs 8, She's saying, come to my gate, come to my door. Now, we talk about spiritual doorways and portals, but in the scripture where it actually talks about it, it's in the Proverbs. It's the doorways in Proverbs 8. It's there. Proverbs 8 says, I have a doorway. You don't see that in a bunch of other... Even here in John, he's not saying I have a doorway. He says, your eyes will be open. But Proverbs 8 says, I have a doorway for you. Okay, thanks. I want us to walk through that doorway. Okay, Bob. I smell the McDonald's. I'm ready to go. All right. Let's just read these last couple, and then we're going to do an engagement. For whoso findeth me findeth life. Well, that's not very fair. I mean, that Jesus is life, right? How dare wisdom say that? That's why, that's why some people think the spirit of wisdom is Jesus, but it's a female spirit. She speaks as a female. Jesus never claimed to be the spirit of wisdom. He's the spirit of the Lord. He is the Lord who is that spirit. Whoso findeth me findeth life shall obtain favor of the Lord. But he that sinneth against me wrongs his own soul. You can sin against wisdom, yes. When wisdom gives you direction and you go against it, that's sinning against wisdom. And you wrong your own soul. All they that hate me love death. Passion translation. For the fountain of life pours into, into you every time that you find me. Every time. Every day. That's why it's every day. I remember one time I hadn't engaged wisdom in quite a while. And um, then I engaged her. And she was not offended that I had not engaged her in a long time. I remember I was talking to Ian about it ago. Ian, she was not offended at all. You know, but it says in, in uh, chapter 8, verse 17, I love them that love me. If you love somebody, you don't you know, just ghost them for a while. But I wasn't ghosting her, just wasn't thinking about it. 
He goes, right, right, right. Wisdom, he goes, she's not offended. These spirit, these, they're, they're not offended. They're there for us. They're not like you. You're offended over everything. You didn't leave the package on the chair on the porch. I said, not on the porch, on the chair on the porch. I promise you, I offend somebody, maybe multiple people, every time I speak. Why? Because they're people, and people are offendable. And they get offended over every kind of thing. And they get offended over things you're not even saying to them. I said something one time about putting $10 in the offer or something. This woman came up. She goes, you knew that I put $10 in the offering and you called me out and, and I just felt an idiot for the whole church. I'm like, I said, I'm going to be honest with you. This is our Northridge church. I said, there's a lot of people there and I didn't even know, I didn't even know she were there. <laughs> I apologize for that. I didn't know you were there. So um, now what are you offended with? I said, I think your offense has something to do with you, not with me. When people are offended, it's something within them. You can ask Nora this. I'm almost never, ever offended by anything by anyone. Why? Because I know people. And people, they, they might offend they, me. Most people aren't trying to offend me. But they might. I might offend you, but I'm not trying. But you know what? These spirits, they're not offended. If you, if you skip a day, they're not offended. Where were you yesterday? They're not offended. It's for your benefit. Every time that you find me, life pours into you. This is the secret of growing in delight and the favor of the Lord. But those who stumble and miss me will be sorry they did. For ignoring what I have to say will bring harm to your own soul. Those who hate me are simply flirting with death. I know that's pretty powerful. Let's just look at that part there. It's from both translations. Whoso findeth me findeth life, for the fountain of life pours into you every time you find me. Well, I'd say, I'd say we could find wisdom right now, right? Actually, the truth is, We've been finding wisdom tonight as we're speaking. The spirit of, feel that anointing here? That's the spirit of wisdom. And it's, we are coming, we have come into her house. We had an interesting thing that happened um, in the meetings. Tina had, like, a, you know, people were having encounters with wisdom, and wisdom was coming up on them like, man, that's pretty advanced encounters. And then Tina had, like, a vision of the seven pillars and her daughter, who's an artist, drew it out. Drew it out. She, she had already drawn it out. And she showed it to her mom. And she goes, oh, my God, I was there. I was in that exact place. I said, that's so awesome. So I asked Jordan to paint me a picture of it. I said, I would like you to paint me a picture of that and send it to me. So that we'll have it here so that you can see the seven pillars of wisdom. Or at least what it looks like in a physical sense, even though we know that they're... I believe they are the seven spirits of God. All right. So you've been sitting for a while. Let's stand up. And I'm going to sit. No. <laughs> now, I, I may not even go through this whole engagement, but I want to very slowly go through the engagement of wisdom. And Rodney, I know you love doing that, but would you mind jumping on the piano anyways? You're... you're Dexterous enough where you could do both. And I want to try to slow myself down because I want to slow you down. And it's it's not the it's the big deal is not actually seeing wisdom, but you might see her. I see her already. That's not the big deal, it's the encounter with her. I've had many encounters with wisdom that I did not see her. But it's the encounter with the scripture. It's the encounter and the deposit that God left us. All of these letters that God left us are a revelation of how to come into close relationship with Him. But we've turned them into theology. And that's where we're losing the young people today. 
You can't give theology to people that could care less. They need an experience with love. What is God's power? God's power is love. Just having power for the sake of power doesn't fulfill you. It's the love of God that fulfills you. Wisdom loves you and she's saying, I want you to love me. She's part of the kingdom. So here we go and I want you to do this with me. We're going to do it very, I'm going to do it as slow as I possibly can. Father in heaven, Father in heaven. and I want you to do it at home as well. I come boldly to your throne of grace and I want you to see yourself right now before his throne of grace it's a throne he's sitting on it but there's no judgment there it's a throne that has grace I pray that you would give unto me the spirit of wisdom the spirit of knowledge spirit of knowledge spirit of understanding Spirit of the fear of the Lord. Spirit of the fear of the Lord. Spirit of counsel. Spirit of counsel. Spirit of might. And prudence. I ask that you would reveal the spirit of wisdom unto me. Let me be filled with the spirit of wisdom. Father, give unto me wisdom. Understanding, largeness of heart, as the sand that is on the seashore. Give me a wise and understanding heart. Wisdom, I watch daily at your gates. And I want us to do that right now. I'm say, I'm watching at your gates. I'm waiting at the posts of your doors. By faith, I stand at the door. Father, I stand at the atmosphere of the spirit of wisdom. Right now, I open the door by faith. I open the door and I step into the atmosphere of the spirit of wisdom. Right now, with your eyes closed, I want you to softly pray in the Holy Spirit. Because you're engaging wisdom right now. Just softly pray in the Holy Spirit. Engage wisdom. Dare kom baba babo chiara kaham baba boba reitara. O rem baba bora kaham diare am baba bo chiara tiare india lolo koma. O rem baba boba babo babo boro kom baba 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 boba rem baba bata. Hey a rom baba babo baba boba baba baba rama. Shim baba bo baba ra kahan di re am baba bo baba bo bo rim baba ta aroma baba ri kahan di re am bo baba bo bo ho rim baba ta aram baba bo baba bo 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 ho ho ri kama machi. Okay, Lord, just a little, just a little bit. How many of you sense that engagement with wisdom tonight? How many of you have sensed that engagement of wisdom? Yes. Most of you. For those of you watching at home, we love you. And I pray, I just feel there's such a presence of God in here. I just pray that God's kingdom would be with you, his righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And I pray that he would give you grace. Grace for tonight, grace for tomorrow, grace for the rest of this week. That you can walk in that grace and walk in his presence. I pray that over you right now, and I bless you, and I say good night.